Thank you, Father Dave. Uh, after you get so old, you don't remember how many conferences you've attended. But uh, we have a Stupidville on the Bayou conference. We've had it now for, um, this is our 10th year. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a promotion going on on the, on the Facebook saying, how many uh, Stupidville uh, conferences has the bishop attended? And uh, I was looking at the other day, they're up to 34. And it's true, I think I've been at 35, 34, 35 conferences uh, over my years as a priest and a bishop. Not only here, but uh, youth conferences and charismatic conferences, et, et cetera. So it always, it's, been, it's always good to come home, to come here, uh, and to just give thanks and praise to God for what God has done. Blessed be God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, as he chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world to be holy, to be without blemish. In love he destined us for adoption in himself to Jesus Christ in accord with the favor of his will for the praise and glory of his grace that he granted us in his beloved. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. It's one of my favorite passages uh, in all of, uh, of the scriptures. It is God's plan and will that we are to be his adopted sons. But because of original sin, we don't come into life as adopted sons of the Father, only as creatures. Only through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is this relationship restored by virtue of his obedience to the Father, even to the death of the cross. From all eternity... The Father chose his own divine Son by nature, the Word to become man and to demonstrate how in his own humanity man could be the Son of the Father. Let me take a little pause here. When I read that passage from Ephesians some time ago, I guess about four or five years ago, it, it struck me that it says, before the world began, God chose us in Christ Jesus. But Christ Jesus was not a reality before the world began. So why does Paul say before the world began, God chose us in Christ Jesus? It is my speculation. It's not, it's, it, it, it's not a, a, a theological a statement, but a speculation on my part. That even if, for some reason, original sin never happened, the Son of God will become man to show us, to teach us how to be sons of the Father, how to be real sons of the Father. And so even though uh, we, we've experienced the, uh, uh, the original sin and even though uh, Jesus has come uh, to redeem us and save us and, and show us the Father, reveal the face of the Father to us, I believe even that had not taken place he would still become man. The Son of God became man to reconcile us back to, to God, to heal the father wound caused by sin, to restore us in, in, to his grace and our grace inheritance as adopted sons of the Father. There was a point that Jesus in his humanity became and was so in love with God the Father that he desired to do only the Father's will, nothing else. As he came to realize the Father's love and the Father's call to him to be the anointed prophesied Messiah, he desired to publicly commit his whole being and life to the Father he loved passionately. So he went to the Jordan to publicly acknowledge his yes to the Father, to the Father's call, to plunge himself totally in doing the will of the Father, being immersed in the Jordan was his yes to the Father. At this moment and in this event, Jesus was sustained by one single experience in his life. After his baptism in the Jordan, while in prayer, he experienced a theophany. The Father, with great joy, said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
And the Spirit filled Jesus in his humanity with a fresh outpouring of anointing and power. The fathers of the church, along with St. John Paul II, said that this was the kiss of the Father that sustained Jesus throughout his life, even on the cross. Have you been kissed by the Father? Have you been kissed by the Father? The answer is yes. We may not know it. We may not remember it. But just as when we were infants, probably our Father kissed us. We don't know it. We don't remember it. But we were kissed by the Father. As priests, deacons, and seminarians, the Father has said to us, and says it again tonight and this week, you are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit has anointed and empowered us and desires to do it again this week. Let's just take a moment and let's reflect on that. God saying to you personally, just as he said to his son Jesus, in a different capacity but the same intentionality, you are my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Sit with that a moment. You are my beloved son. You. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. As ordained priests, we are Alta Christi. The priest is by grace a son of God and a spiritual father of those God gives him. The priest shares as an instrument of God in the spiritual rebirth of his sons and daughters in the waters of baptism. The priest shares in the person of Christ the head in the nourishing of his sons and daughters to the Eucharistic banquet. The priest shares as a spokesman of God in the discipline of his sons and daughters to the sacrament of reconciliation. As deacons and seminarians, you share in the ministry of Christ as priest, prophet, and king because of the, your baptism and confirmation. Every man is a father, naturally or spiritually. As a deacon, you, are married, you who are married are both. As seminarians, you are potential fathers, striving at this point of your discernment to be future spiritual fathers. But before being a father, every man must recognize the, that he is first a son. Not only of his biological father, but form, foremost, his, the son of his heavenly father. It is this primary relationship between God the Father and we, or us, his adopted sons, that is at the heart of the fatherhood of the human father, biological or spiritual. Our image of God as father and our image of ourselves as beloved sons may not reflect the reality of God and the reality of our true identity. Our image of God as Father is sometimes colored and is determined and blurred by our image of our earthly Father. If our human Father was kind, loving, encouraging, caring, patient, outreaching, pers per personally in intimate, correcting but accepting, then we see God the Father similarly. But if our human Father was dis distant, uncaring, disapproving, unemotional, never hugged us or said verbally nor physically that he loved us, too busy for us, never close, hard to talk to, made us fearful of him, punished us unreasonably, then we see the Heavenly Father with the same understanding. The same may be said of your relationship with the bishop and his relationship with you. Like the Heavenly Father, the bishop is called to be a father to his priests, deacons, and seminarians. And you, as loving sons, to him. Pope Francis said to a group of bishops recently, I would ask you in a special way to be close to your priests, supporting them as fathers, easing their burdens, and leading them with tenderness. At another time, he said, This closeness of the bishop is not only fraternal, but also paternal. As they carry out their pastoral ministry, priests often need it. Bishops must not be distant from their priests, or worse, unapproachable. 
Jesus came to reveal the true picture of his father, who is our father. Jesus was a reflection and an instrument of the father's love. I do what the father shows me. To see me is to see the father. The father and I are one. If you know me, you would know the father. And he promised to send the spirit whom the father poured out upon us out of his great love for us. Jesus told us that the Spirit would teach us, remind us all that he, Jesus, taught us. The Spirit who is love, the bond of father, uh, the Father and the Son, his mutual love, will enable us to come to know the Father's love revealed in and through Jesus. To know this love, not only intellectually in our head, but emotionally in our heart and through our personal experience. God the Father loves his Son. The son receives the love in thanksgiving. In receiving the father's love, thus the son acknowledges the father's love and validates it. Knowing that the son receives his love is sufficient for the father who delights in loving his son. The father doesn't look for love in return. However, the son loves the father and therefore responds to the father in love. In turn, Jesus fathered the apostles through love. His love was manifested in acceptance of each one and directing each to reach his full potential in forgiveness and healing and challenging each and providing the best for each and laying down his life for each. It is in the context of that love each finds self-understanding and self-worth. The self-worth is a gift that does not come from the outside but is already a given within them. But that self-worth can only be discovered and acknowledged in the context of love and acceptance. How often in dealing with people, especially men, they don't feel loved. You, I ask the question, are you loved? Yeah, sure. No. Do you know that you're loved down deep in your heart? Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, no. Do you really believe that you are loved? There's this silence. And the response is, no. I really don't believe I'm loved. How unfortunate that is. And yet, that's the reality that we sometimes experience in our own lives. And we have to in, in, encounter in the lives of others. Jesus reveals and the Spirit confirms a Father who cares for us. Jesus does this in his teaching and his actions. The image of the Good Shepherd who goes after the lost sheep, and when he finds it, he rejoices. The parable of the lost coin with the rejoicing upon finding it. Jesus reveals the Father who is merciful and forgiving. As Jesus reached out to the sinners and outcasts, he was saying, I am doing my Father's will, who sends me to show you his love and his mercy, his forgiveness and his reconciliation. When he healed the sick, cast out the demons, raised the dead to life, he was showing the mercy, compassion, and love of the Father. The most beautiful depiction of the Father's love and mercy, compassion, and true desire for us is that told to us in the prodigal, in the parable of the Father and his two sons. I call it the parable of the foolish father. The younger one runs away physically from home, symbolizing his total alienation from the father, and the elder stays home symbolizing obligation but not commitment to the father the father loves both of them and ministers to each as they are the younger son couldn't wait for the father to die there's no indication the father had done anything against the son it was what the father had that motivated the son he was a man of means once he died his two sons would share the inheritance the older would get two-thirds and the younger one-third the younger son couldn't wait for this. Old oh man, as far as I'm concerned, you are dead, and I want nothing more to do with you. I want my future inheritance now. The father loved the son and gave him what was not his yet, but will still belong to the father. The father frees him to wish him dead and to be alienated from the father. He loves him so much, he frees him to make his choice even at the expense of the Father. This is what God does for us. He gives us the freedom of will to choose to love him in a relationship 
or to reject him through sin. Having seen the result of his decision, now destitute, he lost more than his material inheritance. He lost his self-identity, his self-worth, his self-acceptance. He was a nobody, not even good enough to eat the slop of the pigs. His return to the father's house was out of hunger and self-preservation. I don't deserve to be your son. Let me be at least a hired hand, a slave. His shame and guilt remained within him. Even though he said, I've sinned against God and you. He called him father, not as a son, but possibly as a servant would call. The father loves his son. He never stopped loving his son. He longs for the day he will see his son again. He looks for him daily. His prayers go out to him, son, return home. I love you. God waits for us with a greater loving and passionate love. He sends his grace upon us to draw us home, but he waits for us to choose to come home and to be united with him in a father-son, father-son relationship of love. When he sees his son at a distance, the foolish father runs to him, praising God, crying, waving his hand. He embraces him tenderly in his arms and kisses him profusely on his cheek and head. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that his father reacts the same way when one of us returns to him after we ran away because of sin. But something is wrong with this picture. The father is so joyful and the son is cold and unresponsive to the father. Remember the painting of the, of the prodigal son that, that in, the, in, the, in the father hugging the son? What is the son doing? Nothing. He's passive. The father has his arms around him, and the son is just passively there. The father is so joyful, and the son is so cold and unresponsive to the father. He can't even look at the father eye to eye. He can't embrace the father and kiss him on the cheek. He's almost lifeless in the father's embrace. There's something he is holding on to, something that prevents him from experiencing the healing love and freeing mercy, the unconditional acceptance of the father. He feels so full of self-condemning guilt and shame. He feels so totally unworthy. Don't, Father. I don't deserve this. I have sinned against God and you. I'm a loser. You don't know what I've done and how low I have fallen. You don't know how abused I have been by others and who used me for their pleasure as I use them. I've lost my right to sonship. May I be a hard hand or at least can get something to eat and a place to sleep. The father wouldn't hear any of this nonsense. I don't care what others think of, you, you, think of you or think of what you've done. You're my son. You were dead, but now you live. You were lost, but now you are found. Let's celebrate and rejoice. Here are the symbols of your sonship, the robes, the ring, the shoes, the status of son. Tonight and every day, God says to us the same message. You are my son. God the Father wants to embrace each one of us each day with the same abandoned, ab abandoned love, unconditional love, unmerciful love. Each of us needs to know that we are loved for who we are and not for some other motive, in spite of our shortcomings and our failures. When Michelangelo saw the flawed block of marble, he saw the statue of the shepherd boy David within. Everyone saw the ex external flawed object. The artist saw the interior treasure within. This is how God sees us when he looks at our hearts. He sees his image in us. He sees the good that he has already implanted in each of our hearts. He sees our sonship. The father believes in the prodigal son when the son doesn't believe in himself. Even when he purifies us and strips us, God has the vision of himself in us and seeks for our sake to bring it about and not for his sake. The father doesn't possess his son, but frees him to respond or not. There's always the question, why are you doing this? Why are you doing what you're doing? The father says simply, because I love you, 
whether you accept or respond or reject or refuse, I love you. That's my rule as a father, to love you. We can't equate or duplicate God's love for us, but we can imitate his love, be a reflection of his love to others. We can receive his love, and we can be loved. Yes, the priest is a spiritual son of God by grace and a son of the human father by nature. His relationship with the natural father is learned and experienced through the tangible and tactical as well as verbal and nonverbal statements and actions of his human father. Unfortunately, but true, everyone else has father wounds, no matter what degree of love and affection we receive from the human father. For the human father has his own wounds, coming from the imperfection of our human nature, which has been further damaged by original and personal sin. If the priest and deacon as father and seminarian as potential father doesn't realize that he is an adopted son of God the Father, if he doesn't know how to receive the love of the Father, the kiss of the Father, then he would find it hard to fully and properly father his own children in accord with the pattern of the Heavenly Father. These father wounds in us hold us back from receiving this outpouring gift of love and mercy. It is fear, guilt, unworthiness, shame, sin, past failures, things done to us, feelings we don't understand, anger, resentment, failed relationships, unanswered needs, you name it. Yes, name it, but don't own it any longer. All these create a wall insulating and, and isolating us from the Father, even though we cry for all the Father wants to give us. Though our heart wants it, our self-understanding, our scars, and our hurt memories prevent us from experiencing it. Until we let go of the junk within us, we can't know the fullness of the Father's love and mercy. He wants to embrace us with his love. He wants to heal us and restore us to our full inheritance as sons. Many times, because our Father wounds, we resist any of the times God reaches out to love us. We can't accept his love because we wrongly believe that we are not worthy. We are so conscious of our sinfulness that we, don't have a, we have a hard time to be open to the loving mercy and forgiveness of the father. The father of the prodigal son rushed to embrace and kiss his son when he returns home. But the son initially holds the father's embrace, resists the father's embrace and love since the son knows what he has done and thus is not deserving of such lavish affection. But the father is persistent. For he sees his son, not the runaway. He is more happy that the son has chosen to return and is not interested in the sordid details during his alienation from the father. The son seeks only to be a hired hand, but the father refuses anything less than full sonship. So when God seeks to break through the resisting walls of our darkened tomb, instead of initially welcoming the embracing arms, we try to push him away. We try to run, we try to deny or question why and how God could or, or would enter into my self-imposed darkness with his dazzling light. But in spite of our efforts of resistance, God persists in love to speak words of love and words of life and freedom and newness and wholeness. We fight, we struggle, but God will not withdraw. It's almost like we know if we res res resist long enough, God will give up and prove what we fear was real, that he doesn't love us no matter what he says to the contrary. Some of us prefer to settle for the hug rather than the embrace. A hug is one-sided. An embrace is recently is received and mutually and freely responded to. A hug says something from the one hugging, but is not received fully by the one hugged, who is also making a statement. But an embrace, an embrace is welcome, received, responded to, and a gift of love is exchanged. In an embrace, you're included and enclosed in the arms of the other and the other in your arms. Let me share you a story. Many years ago at a Steubenville South conference, it was on the theme of the conference, was Father. And I was called to, to give the, the, the keynote address Saturday night and as I was praying to God, what does he want me to say? I heard God in my heart says, I don't want you to say too much. I want you to show my love. I want you to demonstrate my love. And I said, God, what do you mean? He says, I want you 
to publicly embrace a young man and a young woman and tell them how much you love them as a reflection of my love. I said, Lord, you've got to be kidding. I said, in this milieu, for me to do this publicly with all this sex abuse scandal that's out there, you got to be kidding. And God says, no, I'm not kidding. I want you to do it. I struggled with it. I struggled with it. And so we, I talked to our staff, uh, the conference. I said, you know, if, am, I, am I losing my mind? Am I, am I trying to imagine something? They said, no, do it. I said, thank you. <laughs> and so I said, okay, God, I, I, I will do it. I, if that's what you want me to do, I will do it. And so I had talked to a young man that I was, I was doing spiritual direction with and a young lady that I was doing spiritual direction with. And I was fathering them on the journey. And I said, if I would call you up, would you come up to the stage and allow me to tell you how much I love you and to embrace you in the Father's love? They said, yeah. And so I gave a short introduction, a few words, no, no longer than five, five, ten minutes. And then I said, I told them, this, told them this story. And then I said, I'd like Josh and Kelly to come up. And they both came up to the stage. And I, I looked at Josh and I had my microphone on, and I looked right into his eyes and said, Josh, I love you as a spiritual son. I love you very much, Josh, and I want you to know how much I love you. And I gave him a bear, a bear hug, and I just held him in my arms, and he just, just held me in his arms. And then I went to Kelly, and I said the exact same thing, and I held her in my arms, and she held me in her arms. I couldn't see the reaction of the, the congregation and the crowd because I was in light and they were in darkness. But the staff said, Bishop, there was not a dry eye in the group of young people. They all wanted to know that they're loved. They all wanted that embrace. They wanted that tangible touch that says that they're worth something and that they are loved. And I can't tell you, after each of the conferences, the, the, the student conferences that, that I've been part of uh, over the years since then, how many young people, when I'm standing outside on Sunday uh, morning uh, uh, after the Mass, how many young people just come up right to me and just throw their arms and hug me. And they just want to be hugged. They want to be loved. They want to know that someone, someone loves them. And we represent God. We are the, the Christ. They're looking for us to show them that love. And I know it's dangerous, and I know it would, some people would say this goes against the charter. But my, my recommendation to my priest uh, was this. I want you to be a father, a spiritual father. I want you to be a holy man. I want you to love in a holy way. I want you to love your people, and I want you to show your love to your people. And if you are doing something right and good and holy and you are loving your, your, your people and your kids and you are, you are charged by somebody, I'll defend you. I'll be there with you as long as you haven't done anything wrong. I want you to know that they need your love. The father in the, product, in the parable asked no questions. He simply wanted his son to know how happy he was to have him home, to see his face again, to share with him his life in all things. The son must make a choice. Would he drop all the ways he saw himself, all the ways he heard his father and himself, all the negative things he thought and said of his father? Is he willing to be son again? Or are you willing to be sons again? But there's another son in the picture. He has been angry over the fact that his father has been looking for this no good kid. That anger explodes when he finds out the, the younger brother's home, that the father has joyfully welcomed him back and restored him fully to sonship without question asked or punishment exacted, and that the father is actually throwing a party for him. 
What a foolish and stupid old man. The anger intensifies when he thinks of how faithful he has been to the Father and has never received any signs of gratitude, like a party in his honor. He has acted out of obligation, hoping for some reward. He wanted to do the same with his younger son, but was afraid that his father would disown him. He was more the servant than the son. He is angry at the brother and angry at the father and maybe angry at himself. What a fool I have been all these years, working to please my father for what? The father loves both. He goes out to his son and shows him how much he loves him and accepts him. He asks him to let go his anger, jealousy, resentment, superiority, arrogance, and allow the loving father to embrace him as well. Jesus doesn't tell us what the younger son's response to the father was, nor that of the older son. He only tells us of the loving father who reveals the love and mercy, the acceptance and joy of the heavenly father when one lost son or daughter comes home to his embrace. God wants to hold us in that embrace of his loving arms tonight. But first... We need to let go our past hurts and scars. What are those hurts and scars? In your relationship to your father? In relationship to your bishop? In relationship to superiors? What are those scars? What are those hurts? Why are you hanging on to them? Didn't Paul say, don't let the sun go down on your anger? Don't give the devil a chance? So what are those scars? And what are those angers? And what does God want to do for us? I want to talk very quickly about a scar that I've experienced. It wasn't directly from my father, but it's a wound. It was from my mother. But my father was part of of the scar. Over the years, as, as a priest, as I was grow, going into my ministry, uh, there was there was always a, 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 a major stumbling block that I would that I would experience, and that was uh, uh, when a dominating woman would so, somehow or another uh, come against me. What happened was uh, we were having a pre preparation for a conference, and as we were preparing for this conference, uh, this lady uh, was part of the conference team, and she was my thorn in my side. You ever had one of those people that always was, was a thorn in your side? Well, she was that thorn in my side. And so after, after we had this little confrontation at the, uh, during the meeting, she says, I want to talk to you. Well, I didn't want to talk to her. But as a nice guy, I said, okay, let's go to my office. So we went in my office, and she reamed me down one, up one side and down the other side. I said, I was the worst person that could ever exist in the world, and how could I ever be a priest? Da, 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 da. Well, she pushed the wrong button. When she starts attacking me this way, all of a sudden, my throat became very tight, and, uh, and the rage began to uh, uh, come from the uh, bottom of my toes, and I finally said, Get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. And she says, I don't want to talk to you either. Slam, bang, out she went. I was embarrassed because there's a group of people right outside the other side of the door that heard this whole explosion. And I knew I had to go from the here to there to get outside. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. You know what charismatics do when they have situations? Can we pray with you, Father? I didn't want anybody to touch me, pray with me, do anything. I want out. So I said, yeah, sure, fine, pray with me. <laughs> I left. I'm boiling. The next day, I began my annual retreat. And as I began the retreat, I, I said to God, God, what is this rage? What is this situation that, that I have no control over? And God, in his mercy, Revealed to me, he says, it's always been a woman. Yes, I know. I said, what is the root? And it's in my heart, I heard your mother. 
I said, you missed that, God. <laughs> Mom and I were like that. I was, out of two sons, I was the spoiled one. I was the, I was the, 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 the good one. I was the one that was uh, catered to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, no, that can't be. And God said, yes, it was. When you were a child, he said, you saw your mother, you perceived your mother dominating your father. And as a child, you resented your mother for dominating your father. And as a child, you resented your father for allowing your mother to dominate. This was your perception. And because you couldn't do anything as a child, you buried it. And every time you saw that happening, every time you had that experience, you just deep, uh, dug a deeper hole and buried it. And then as a priest, when a woman began to dominate you, you would explode. And I said, what must I do? And God said, forgive. Forgive. And I said, mom's dead. It doesn't make a difference, he said. You have to forgive her for what you perceive that she did to you. And you have to forgive your father for what you perceived he did to you. And so I began to just cry out in, 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 in tears and just began to, to forgive my mom, forgive my dad, ask my mom's forgiveness, ask my dad's forgiveness. He says, you got to forgive yourself. I forgave myself. And I just took all that junk and I put it at the foot of the cross. And he says, now let's go over your history. And one woman after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, he would show me. And I'd do the same process. And finally, at, when I finally got to the thorn in my side, you know, I was, I was felt such a release, as a relief that I was free now. I didn't have this, this, this burden that was holding me back and, and causing such great pain. And a week after I came back from retreat, I'm about ready to go to bed, and I get a phone call 11 o'clock at night, and guess who? The thorn in my side. And she just begins, again, re, re me up one side and down the other because I didn't do X, Y, and Z, or I did it wrong, and da, 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 And I'm sitting in my chair internally laughing. And after 20 minutes, she didn't take a break. But after 20 minutes, when she took a break, I said, are you finished? Yes. Good night. <laughs> I was free. Whatever that score was, God in his mercy and his, and his love freed me. And so I could see my father and talk to my father. I had a great relationship with my father in the last six years of his life. He lived with me. And I wasn't sure if I was the pastor. He was the pastor, but he lived with me. And we had a great relationship. But it was because of the healing. That's what God wants to do in each of our lives. It may be God scarred us, we think. Or the church scarred us, we think. Or uh, somebody who in the church scarred us, we think. No matter what it was, God says, get in touch with it. I want to free you. Because that scar is affecting your relationship with me. I want to break in. I want to, I want to fill you with my life. But I can't fill you. Because you've got such a small opening for me to enter into. Open up. And what's restricting that is all this anger and resentment and bitterness and non-forgiveness and unworthiness and all the junk of your past. That's the res res restricting you from receiving the fuller openness of my love. So tonight, this week, Hear the, the call of God in your hearts. Let God reveal to you what does he want to heal in your heart, in your life, so that he can truly be the Father. Ask forgiveness. Forgive and ask forgiveness. Ask God's forgiveness. Give away and place at the foot of the cross all the junk. Let it go so that God can be God in our lives. He wants to embrace us. Open your heart to that embrace and respond to that embrace. In a short while, we will have the opportunity to receive the sacrament of reconciliation. It's, a, it's that moment that God wants to break through. 
no matter what our past was and has been, God wants to break through because he has so much love to give us. And so in the sacrament of reconciliation, here is the moment in which he wants to pour out his love in you in a fresh new way. And tomorrow when we celebrate the Eucharist, if we, if we have opened our hearts uh, uh, even a little bit more to his love, then he can pour more love into us. And so get in touch. Get in touch. And let this night truly be a night of new life. That you will hear again, you are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased.